This afternoon we're going to be looking at the reliability of Jesus and the gospel accounts and some examples of that. But before we do so, I've been asked to uh, just briefly mention some of the other alleged uh, quote-unquote atheist-making Bible verses that um, you might read on various lists of atheists that should make people atheists rather than Christians. And so let me just mention, in addition to some of the ones that we looked at this morning in the Bible class period, such as Lot um, offering his daughters to the men of Sodom and God telling Abraham to kill his son in Genesis 22 too, uh, there is also the passage there in Judges chapter 11. In fact, someone asked me about this passage earlier today, and Jephthah making a vow that the first thing to come out of his house uh, that he would sacrifice if God gave him the victory over his enemies. And so supposedly God accepted this when actually it never says that God was happy with what Jephthah did. And also there is some question about what exactly Jephthah did actually sacrifice. And um, I would, and how exactly he quote unquote sacrificed his daughter. Uh, there are two articles on the Apologetics Press website that you can access by way of computer or your smartphone. Uh, one is called Atheist Making Bible Verses You Need to Know, and the other one is very similar to that. It's part two. It's called More Atheist Making Bible Verses That You Ought to Know. And these would be discussed in there. We briefly talked about the allegations against God killing people, and uh, uh, we, we noted just briefly that, you know, at the end of time, you know, people make a, a uh, they have a big complaint, some people do, about God uh, judging various nations and both the unrighteous and some righteous, such as um, uh, innocent children, were uh, hurt during those uh, times of judgment. Well, there is some similarity between that and the end of time in that Jesus is going to come back one day. And let's say that you're a righteous person when Jesus comes back. And you're enjoying your life. Let's say that you're at Disney World on the day that Jesus comes back. And you're having the time of your life. Um, when Jesus comes back and he stops your Disney World trip and he ends your physical life as you know it, is he a mean God for doing that? Or is he a mean, unjust, unkind, unloving God for um, uh, judging unrighteous peoples and, and nations, whether in the physical history that we know has taken place or whether it is in the future such as with spiritual judgment. So there is a very real sense in which all life is coming to an end and that all spiritual life, uh, all earthly life is coming to an end and that spiritual life will continue and uh, which brings us to another few points but uh, I'll just mention that there are some others such as God allegedly being sinfully jealous and insecure. This is a criticism that Dan Barker makes very loudly of the God of the Bible. And yet I would contend, again, I don't really have the time, and my intention was not to go over these verses, but I was asked to go over some more of these, or at least just mention them. Uh, I would contend that God is jealous like a righteous husband and wife are jealous of each other's love. You know, if you were, if my, if I was to, uh, someone were to send me a, a picture of my wife right now, uh, smooching on another man, you think that I would have a, I could have a righteous jealousy built up in me? Y'all use the word smooching up here, you know, kissing all over. I'm not talking about, you know, some kind of kiss on the forehead, which might be kind of odd, or you know, a kiss on the cheek, which I would find odd. But you know, a, I mean, a real like husband and wife kind of kiss. Would I have a right as a loving, um, protective, and concerned husband, would I have a right to be righteously jealous of that? Well, you see, we are, God created us in part to want to serve Him, love Him, and worship Him. And when man chooses to serve and worship anything or anyone else other than Him, then we are doing that which disappoints him and which causes him to be very angry. Uh, not, because, um, not because he is a mean, hateful, angry God, but because he knows that if you want to live forever with him, you are to show honor to him and faithfulness to him. We already mentioned God allegedly wanting babies to dash 
God wanting people to dash their babies and to be happy to do so against the rocks. And that's just a misuse of Psalm 137, verses 8 and 9. And believe it or not, I believe it is in the, um, in the article by the London Times on the you know, top 10 worst verses of the Bible, some form of that title. They mention God's commands of wives to submit to their husbands. And I believe this is actually mentioned twice, twice in their list, or at least a form of it, maybe two different verses, because there is more than one verse that would indicate something similar to this. And uh, so some, they, some people say in this day and time, well, that's just a terrible verse. Just terrible that God would ever want um, you know, wives to submit to their husbands. And, and really the problem that most people have with such verses is, is, uh, is that they don't like the roles that God has defined in Scripture. Um, the fact is, God loves women just as equally as He loves men. And men, uh, He loves as equally as He loves women. He made men and women in His image. Genesis 1, 26 and 27 makes that very clear. He uh, had a plan which He began to detail after sin entered the world to say not just men, but men and women. There is no distinction between men and women in this sense. Uh, Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 29. Uh, whether you are male or female or slave or free, um, it doesn't matter who you are. God died for, Jesus died for all of us, uh, and He loves all of us. Uh, it doesn't matter. However, however, God made this physical realm in such a way that there would be some kind of order to it. Let me give you an example. Uh, did God have to say, did God have to say, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, and promise that it may be well with you and you may live long upon the earth? Did he have to make that as one of the Ten Commandments? No, he didn't have to. Could God have said, children, you do whatever you please. Just do whatever you please. You know, I never hear anyone say, I never hear any adults say, yeah, it's not a good thing for children to obey their parents. I mean, if God never said that, and by the way, if there is no God, and atheism is true, and I were a child of atheists and claimed atheists myself, uh, atheism, and my mom and dad told me to do something I didn't want to do, I would just say, well, why do I need to obey you? Now, they might say, well, because I'm going to make you go live in the doghouse if you don't obey me. I could say, well, fine, I'd like to live in the doghouse. You see, what, upon what standard can you say that that's right and this is wrong? You know, I'm like, let's say I'm a 15-year-old uh, big, and I've known some big 15-year-olds. I, I know one man, or one young man who's playing ball at Texas A&M right now, and he was 15 years old. He looked like a grown man. I mean, he was a big old boy. And, uh, you know, there's some 15-year-old boys who are stronger than their dads. And if they had to wrestle or fight with their dad, they could defeat their dad. So maybe a 15-year-old boy just says, well, dad, you know, I'm tougher than you. I'm stronger than you. I can, I can take everything you have. You know, you're, you're weaker than I am. Doesn't might make right. And who's to say that a child, a 15-year-old son, has to obey his parents? Well, you know who says that? God says that. And God says it, and that settles the matter, whether you like it or not. And the fact is, God set up his human creation so that there would be, by the way, why should, why should a marriage between a man and a woman be the right kind of marriage and the only kind of marriage? Well, because that's what God created. But you see, a lot of people in the world don't like that. And a lot of people don't like that the husband is said to be the head of the wife. The husband is the head of the house. And some people don't like that. And by the way, there might be some men who don't like that. There might be some men who say, you know, I don't like it when the Bible says that the husband is to love his wife just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Or maybe husbands, there are husbands who say, I don't want to give myself for my wife. I'm, I, I kind of would rather be, you know, subjected to my wife uh, rather, you know, than, than me be, you know, the one who makes the, you might say, a, the final decision if it came down to something like that. However, please understand, when the Bible talks about uh, uh, wives submitting themselves to their husbands, you know, in that same, in one of those same passages, like in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, uh, verse 7 tells us that husbands are to dwell with their wives with understanding. Um, as to the realizing, 
giving honor, that is, to the wife. You know, so the Bible says that husbands ought to honor their wives. Hmm. Some husbands may not want to do that, but you know what? The Bible says to do that. The Bible also says that all of you are to be submissive one to another. So there are a lot of these so-called atheist-making Bible verses. Another big one would be God commanding slaves to submit to their masters. And you can read that in various passages like uh, various letters of epistles of Paul, like Ephesians and Colossians and 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 and 19, verses 18 and following, servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the, to the harsh. And so a lot of people read that and they think, I've heard all sorts of people claim that the God of the Bible is a mean monster because of how the Bible talks about slavery. But the fact of the matter is, a lot of people make assumptions about the kind of, the alleged kinds of slavery that God is okay with. Okay? But we have to remember, again, how these things are defined. You know what God has never been um, okay with and never approved is sinful slavery. Well, you say, Eric, I thought all kind of slavery was sinful. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, do you know anyone who's in prison? Is that a type of slavery? I mean, you, you know, anyone who's in prison who's forced to do things that he or she does not want to do. Have you ever seen prisoners who are working and not really, would rather not be doing that work and would not, rather not be in a eight by eight, you know, prison cell. Uh, that's a type of servitude or slavery. But let me ask you this. Anybody in here pay taxes? Hmm. We're here to get taxes to them. Taxes are due. I'm not making light of this. I'm just saying that, you know, in the first century, that a lot of people became slaves because they did not pay their taxes or they could not pay their taxes. And so they went into in, uh, in servitude or they became enslaved because of that. You know what happens in America? At least, you know, if you know if you're not a friend of some of the politicians and you're maybe on the wrong side of some of the politicians and you don't pay your taxes. And you know there are some people in America who pay more in taxes than they pay. And I'm not I'm not against paying taxes, okay? I appreciate the nice roads that we get to drive on, et cetera, et cetera. But there are some people who pay, pay more in taxes than they do in, in, in food, in shelter, and in clothing. And they pay more in taxes. And if you don't pay the amount of tax that the government says you have to pay, do you know what can happen to you for not paying taxes? You tell me. Well, you can be jailed. You can go to prison for that. Do you know what they call that 2,000 years ago? They call that slavery. Oh, by the way, do you know a lot of slaves also became slaves when they were captured in war, in wartime? That's how many people became slaves. Do you know, my dad was drafted into the Army back in about 1952. My dad was born in 1935, so 1952, 1953, right after World War II. You know, my dad didn't have a say in whether he had to go to the Army or not. He was just drafted. You know that every 18-year-old male in this country uh, has to, you know, basically sign up and say, you know, I forgot what they call it. You have to fill out some kind of form, or at least you used to. And, um, you know, you could be forced into military service. Do you know what they would have called that 2,000 years ago? If you were forced to go to war uh, and possibly die, well, they would have called that servitude or enslavement. So, see, a lot of people, it, a lot of people think, they assume that biblical definitions are their definitions and that their definitions must be what the Bible must be talking about. But the fact is, the Bible writers have never, and God has never been okay with anything that is sinful. And there are some forms of, for example, slavery that are absolutely sinful. And you know, when Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, he referred to the lawless and insubordinate and how they are ungodly and sinners and how uh, he was referring to the unholy and profane uh, murderers of fathers and mothers and manslayers, fornicators, sodomites, and then he mentioned kidnappers. Or, as some translations translate this, men stealers. Or as certain Greek dictionaries refer to this, as slave dealers. You know what Paul is condemning here? Is the ripping of people from their homes and stealing them and selling them as slaves. You know what a lot of slavery was uh, back earlier in this country's history? There was a lot of 
stealing of people in other places and in some of those places the very people who lived there were stealing others and then they were selling them and so God certainly is not okay with that kind of uh, that kind of slavery any kind of sinful slavery but another thing really that people has, have rebelled against with God and boy, I've really gone a lot longer on this than I thought I was so uh, thank you, Leonard, for letting me get to talk about this a little bit today. Listen, we haven't even reached our introduction for the afternoon lesson. But the good thing for you is I'm full and I'm kind of tired. And so um, that time is just around the corner for all of us, right? So I don't plan on going for a couple of hours today. Some of y'all are looking at me like, this guy, I don't know about him. Okay, so uh, let, me, let me also just say that a lot of people, they just cannot stand the biblical message of submissiveness. A lot of people can't stand the idea of 1 Corinthians chapter 7 where God says, um, you know, keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Don't be concerned about it. But if you can be made free, rather use it. For he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freedman. Likewise, he was called while free is Christ's slave. You know, if I was a slave in the first century, for whatever reason, whether it was a, a righteous reason or an unrighteous reason, I mean, maybe I stole a number of things or cheated the government or whatever, and I became a slave. I was a slave to someone for evil, wicked deeds that I had committed. And I became a Christian. Then God would expect me to continue my servitude just like a good worker not pleasing men, but pleasing God. That's what we read Paul saying to uh, the, the brethren there at Colossae. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23, he said, and this is in context of bond servants or slaves, verse 22. Obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. So whether I was a slave or a freedman in the first century and I became a Christian, you know what God would expect me to be? The best Christian I could be in whatever situation that I was, was in. You know, if there was a, an individual, let's say it was a woman in the first century who wasn't in the best marriage, and she became a Christian, did God want her to remain in that marriage? Absolutely. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, would God want her to use her good influence on her husband to try to win him over to Christ? Absolutely. You know, sometimes I get asked questions about marriage, divorce, and remarriage, and some people say, well, you know, my husband or my wife, recently, I, uh, of recent years, I knew a, a serious situation where a man was just basically tired of his wife. And uh, he just, you know, could not, he said, just could not live with her anymore. And I just... You know, I, I think back about scriptures and how, listen, if God even expected slaves to remain slaves if they had to and if they could not get out of their enslavement, He certainly expects men and women who may think that they don't have the ideal marriage to remain married because what God has joined together, let not man separate. The fact of the matter is uh, the Bible has a message of submissiveness of one to another. And uh, we need to see the seriousness of that. If you want to read about submissiveness, read the epistle of 1 Peter, five chapters. And you can read where, where servants are to be submissive to their masters, where wives are, wives are to be submissive to their husbands, where uh, churches are to be submissive to their elders, where younger people are to be submissive to their, the older people, or maybe that is directly to the elders. And then it says, all of you be submissive one to another. Last but not least, I don't have ten of these in this PowerPoint, but number nine, and you can imagine why some people are upset about this, they just cannot stand the idea that Jesus Christ preached a hellfire and brimstone, as it is called, kind of message. And you know, the truth of the matter is, there are a lot of members of the body of Christ. There are a lot of preachers in the church who don't preach what the Bible says about heaven and hell. And a lot of people are, a lot of people who claim to be religious, who claim to be Christians, who claim to be Bible readers, may not have read their Bibles very closely because Jesus taught more about eternal punishment than any other 
uh, spokesman in, in Scripture and than any Bible writer. Do you remember what Jesus said in Matthew 25, 41? That he would say to you on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Verse 46, And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into um, into eternal life. And he said much more about that, including in Mark chapter um, chapter 9, verse verse 40, I'll read verse 40, uh, 43, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life main rather than having two hands to go into hell and to the fire that shall never be quenched, where the worm, verse 48, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And some people say, well, well, some people like Bertrand Russell, who I will just use to transition into uh, some other thoughts here. Bertrand Russell was one of the more well-known critics of Christianity of the 20th century. He was a well-known um, enemy of Christianity, an agnostic. And um, in his book on why I am not a Christian, he had a lot of things to say about why he doesn't follow Jesus. In fact, he said, I do not believe one can grant either superlative wisdom or the superlative goodness of Christ as depicted in the Gospels. I'm concerned with Christ as he appears in the Gospels, taking the Gospel narrative as it stands, and there one does find some things that do not seem to be very wise. And then he would go on, uh, which I don't talk about that in, in some of these slides I'm about to show you for just a few moments here, but he would go on in that pamphlet titled Why I'm Not a Christian, which was on the New York Public Library's Books of the Century list last century, he would say that Jesus' teachings on hell are some of the most troubling things in all of Scripture. And you know what? They are very serious teachings. But what a lot of people forget, or a lot of people don't take the time to really um, grasp or understand, and that is God's serious teachings on hell should help us to realize, number one, how serious and sad and dangerous sin is. You know how sin is portrayed in the world today? If it's ever portrayed, isn't it normally portrayed as just kind of a lighthearted, what's the big deal, let's laugh at it kind of sin? I mean, you don't have to turn on some wicked, quote unquote, you know, kind of wicked channels and go to, you know, wicked websites. You can go to what may be considered relatively tame television channels and websites where a lie will be, you know, on just about any sitcom in this day and time, and has been this way for decades now, someone tells a lie on a sitcom. What do you hear in the background? Laughter. And yet lie, lying has been a sin uh, forever. Our God is a God of truth. Lying is a sin. You know what people get us to think about sin? Is that it's not that big a deal. You know what Jesus wants people to know about sin that is not taken care of, sin that is not repented of, sin that does not have the blood of Jesus covering it, that that sin will cause people to lose their souls eternally. And so, yeah, Jesus teaches about heaven and hell. Jesus, our loving God, who is also a just and holy God, who cannot fellowship sin, God, it, it, by His very nature, he cannot uh, be with, in an approving kind of way, sin. He is pure and holy. And so the only people who have sinned who will be in heaven will, those, will be those who have had their sins removed or covered by the blood of the Lamb and they have reunited and they have come in contact with God. You know, the Hebrews writer said in Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verses 19 and following, he talks about how we have come back in contact and come back into the holy of holies, saying, brethren, having boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. It's by the blood of Jesus that we can be saved. And sin is very serious. And sin will cause people who haven't who haven't decided to accept the remedy for the sin to be lost forever. You know, again, a lot of people understand the uh, seriousness, or excuse me, uh, the reasonableness of punishment. You know, people generally expect those who do terribly wicked things to be punished. And so even unbelievers and atheists would contend, okay, yeah, we can see that, but what about being punished forever and ever? Well, let me ask you something. 
Does punishment depend on how long the crime took to take? The, the, how long the crime took, you know, to, to do? Let me ask you this. When someone, let's say that someone gets mad. This is a, I, I, I was, I was told about this years ago. I believe I read a story on it, how there was a, uh, you know, I heard about Alabama fans being kind of rabid fans, that there was a father who actually shot his son after an Alabama game because his son was joking with him about Alabama losing. So let's just assume, not in that situation, I don't think he actually killed him. That was a terrible thing that happened. But let's just suppose that the father killed his son in a moment of rage. Do you think that father should be in prison for that crime or receive some major punishment for that? Well, let's just say this. Shouldn't the punishment only be as long as it took for the crime to take place? Should the punishment be for, you know, two minutes? Well, isn't punishment for two weeks a lot longer than two minutes? And how can that be right? Or how can punishment, I mean, two years? That's a long time to be punished when the crime only took two minutes or less to commit. Or what about 20 years or a lifetime? Or what about capital punishment? What if you just took the rest of his physical life? Here's my point. And you can read about this on our, again, on our website. That... Uh, um, mankind, even mankind, oftentimes sees that the punishment should be hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of times longer than it actually took to commit the crime. Some might say, well, I just think that eternal punishment is too long. Well, number one, again, I would say that we don't understand how bad sin is. And number two, God and God who has never sinned and God who is eternal, that he is in a much better uh, place to judge how sin should be punished and how long that punishment should be. Um, let me just go through a couple of examples of those who would contend that Jesus was a really bad guy. Uh, allegedly, Jesus was a liar because he said, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. And if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. So Jesus supposedly just was a false prophet. He was a liar because... And this is what he said. And you know what? When you look at these two verses and you put them side by side or one on top of the other, admittedly, they look like they are saying the very opposite, right? If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. My witness is true. But remember the principle we dealt with last night in the second hour. Are we talking about the same person, place, or thing at the same time in the same sense? Is it possible to say these two opposite statements in the same, in different senses. We lost the game, we won the game. Hmm, how, could, how could both of those statements be true? If we're talking about the same game, at the same time. Well, maybe you're familiar with the 1990 Missouri-Colorado football game in which there was 30 seconds left to go and Missouri was up 31 to 27. Colorado had the ball first and goal at the Missouri three-yard line and Colorado spiked the ball to stop the clock. And then on second down, they ran the ball but failed to score. On third down, they ran the ball again. Then on fourth down, they spiked the ball to stop the clock so they could run a touchdown on fifth down at the end of the game. Anybody see a problem with this? Anybody see a problem with, with, with the number of downs we have here? Well, if you know anything at all about football, and I think they play it the same way up here as they do down south, right? You know, uh, you see that, that there aren't supposed to be five downs. You see, according to the referees, Colorado won the game 33-31. to 31. But did Colorado really win the game? I mean, do you think it would have been appropriate for a Missouri player to say after the game who they should have received the ball back after fourth down and all they would have done was kneel down and then the game's over? I mean, that's it. They won the game in one sense. But according to the record books, you know who won the game? Colorado, if I'm not mistaken, this was the same year that Colorado won a share of the national championship. Did they beat Missouri or did they lose to Missouri? Well, it might depend on who you ask and what they mean when they tell you we won that game or we lost that game. So how could Jesus say, if I'm a witness of myself, my witness is true and not true? In fact, why would Jesus ever say, my witness is not true? Because a lot of people have misunderstood what he meant in John 5, 31. When he says, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true, he's not saying he's a liar. He is talking about, um, in a court of law, for example, 
if all you do is bear witness of your, yourself, if all you have to prove something is your own testimony and that is absolutely it, there's nothing else to prove what you're wanting to prove, Jesus said it's not true. Meaning it's not valid. It's not going to hold up even a, 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 among the Jews, among the Gentile, excuse me, among the Greeks or among the Romans, they basically understood and had this same principle according to their laws, especially according to the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 19.15, Deuteronomy 17.6. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. But you see, Jesus went on then in John chapter 5 to say that John the baptizer bears witness of me, the Father bears witness of me. The miracles that I work bear witness of me. The scriptures, the prophecies uh, that foretold of me, the prophecies that I am fulfilling, all of these bear witness of me. Moses, he said, specifically wrote about me. But if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. So here's all these other witnesses. And then in John chapter 8, when his enemies say to him, you bear witness of yourself, your witness is not true. Here was Jesus' response. Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. Now, could he have meant in that passage simply, I'm telling the truth. I'm telling the truth. Whether it would hold up in a court of law or not, I'm telling you the truth. But then even there in John chapter 8, he went on to mention another witness on his behalf. Okay, here's another kind of somewhat brief uh, criticism of Jesus. And that is, allegedly, Jesus was terribly disrespectful, for example, to his own mother when she came to him and said they have no wine in John chapter 2. He responded by saying, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. So let me just ask you, what do you think would happen at my house? Some of you have gotten to know me a little better this weekend. And uh, I've told you I have two sons. And if my two sons came home from where they live now in Tennessee, and my wife asked them, told them, Bo and Micah, I need you guys to take out the trash. And if they said, woman, what does that trash have to do with me? What does that trash have to do with us? What do you think their dad and their mother's husband would do at that moment in time. I would at the very least probably push my chair back from the table and, you know, just show them my pants, my belt, and all that stuff and say, uh, boys, they're young men now, but they would be called boys at that moment in time. Uh, boys, you don't ever talk to my wife and your mother that way. You weren't allowed to do that when you were raised here and you're not allowed to do that now. I totally get in this day and time, that sounds somewhat disrespectful. In fact, Richard Dawkins, the famous atheist that he is, he said, Jesus' family values, it has to be admitted, were not such as one might wish to focus on. He was short to the point of brusqueness with his own mother. Dennis McKenzie said in Matthew 15, 4, he, Jesus, told people to honor thy father and thy mother, yet he was one of the first to ignore his own maxim by uh, saying to his mother in John 2, 4, woman, what, does, what have I to do with thee? He went on to say, imagine someone talking to his own mother in such a disrespectful manner and addressing her by such an impersonal noun as woman. Talk about insolent offspring. Jesus, allegedly, needs to practice some parental respect. There again, as we've mentioned a few times this weekend, you know what? In English, in 21st century America, in our culture, in our day and time, referring to a mother... Uh, by the word woman, you know, I, uh, I don't know that I've ever referred to my wife, you know, by that word. If I did, I'm sure my, wife, my wife's eyebrows would raise up like, do what? I, I, I'll probably get that, and, you know, I'm not saying that she is a disrespectful wife, I'm saying she would be, where did that come from? It sounds different today than it did 2,000 years ago, in a different country, in a different culture, where different languages were spoken, and they had different figures of speech and different ways of talking. Jesus used this same woman, the same word woman, when complimenting the Syrophoenician's faith, uh, great faith there in Matthew chapter 15, saying, woman, great is your faith. He used this term, woman, why are you weeping when talking affectionately to Mary Magdalene after his resurrection? He didn't say, woman, 
Why are you weeping? It was an affectionate address. He was very tender-hearted, and the use of the word woman was appropriate in that day, in that time, in that culture by Jesus. What about when he was dying on the cross and he addressed his own mother? Not, woman, behold your son. He was dying on the cross. I, I've not even ever heard an unbeliever saying that, well, that was disrespectful. But they are quick to point out that it must be interpreted as Jesus being uh, you know, brutish and disrespectful in John chapter 2 and verse 4. But that simply is not the case, and it could not be and has not been proven. So why did he use the term gune instead of mater or woman instead of mother? Well, some have suggested maybe at that point in time in John 2, he was indicating that a new relationship was beginning between uh, him and his mother as he was beginning his ministry, but we can't really know for sure. And critics cannot prove that Jesus was acting disrespectfully toward his mother. Last but not least, before our time um, is getting away from us here, I just want to deal with what was read for us a few moments ago from Matthew chapter 12, as it is compared with other statements that you can find in Scripture about Jesus and when he rose from the dead. You see, there are passages that indicate that Jesus would rise on the third day. And there... Uh, for example, in Mark chapter 8, verse 31, you can read where he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and after three days rise again. And yet, Jesus said, for as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So those sound like to us today to be very different kinds of statements. But again, what did it mean in that day and that time? And is it possible that it meant something different than how we would kind of think about it today? You know, Eliezer ben Azariah, quoted from the Jerusalem Talmud, who lived around the year A.D. 100. So you might say in, you know, historically, you know, Bible times, though later uh, at the end of the New Testament era. He is quoted as saying, a day and a night are an ona, or a portion of time. And the portion of an ona is as the whole of it. You know, if we allow the Bible to explain the Bible, here's what we find. Is that we know that it rained for 40 days, but it also rained during the flood. The Bible tells us not just the days, but it mentions 40 days and 40 nights. But are we to conclude by this... Um, that it was and had to be literally 40 days times 24 hours, and it had to be literally those many hours. I've never heard anyone that said, would say that it would have to be exactly and precisely that many hours. You know, when Joseph's brothers came to him in Egypt, the Bible says that Joseph put his brothers in prison for three days. And then on the third day, he released all of his brothers except one. On the third day. So were they in the prison? Were they in prison for three days or not? Well, they were in the prison for a part of three days. Perhaps this is never made more clear than the Second Chronicles chapter 10, where the Israelites came before Rehoboam when he was king after King Solomon, and it was still a united kingdom. And he came, they came to, Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam, and they were asking Rehoboam to lighten their burdensome load, their service. Um, and so they said to him, or he said to them, come back to me after three days, and the people departed. Now, again, let's allow the Bible to explain itself. How does it use this kind of terminology? The king says, come back to me after three days. How do the people understand that? Well, we don't have to wonder because the Bible goes on to tell us in verse 12, so Jeroboam and all the people came back to, they came to Rehoboam on the third day as the king had directed saying, come back to me the third day. But I thought the king said, come back to me after three days. He did. And how do they understand it? To be on the third day. You may not like this. It may sound odd to us. We may scratch our head and say, well, that's not how I would word it. But that doesn't make how they reckon time uh, incorrectly. You know, the, the Bible tells us that Esther fasted and had others and wanted others to fast three days for night and day. And yet the Bible says she went into before King Ahasuerus on the third day, presumably when her fast had ended on 
the third day. I suppose this was not made any clearer than maybe Second Chronicles there in chapter 10 as it was uh, in Acts chapter 10, where if you were to calculate the, uh, the amount of time between when Cornelius received his, uh, when Cornelius was told to go send people to Peter, uh, the Bible tells us that that was at the, that was at the ninth hour of the day. He saw clearly an angel of God coming to him, saying to him, Cornelius, the ninth hour of the day. Now notice this. In chapter 10 and verse 30, Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour. At the ninth hour. And he says this was four days ago. But if you were to calculate this backwards, and you were to look at the very verses that I have on the screen here, you would say it was, you would find out it was a literal 72 hours earlier, which he calls four days ago. But it's 72 hours ago. Why would he say four days ago? Because if he is on Thursday making this statement, and 72 hours ago would have been on what day? Well, it would have been on Monday. We might say three days ago, but in that day, in that culture, do you know how they refer to it? They refer to it as, well, a part of Monday and a, a part of Monday and a part of Thursday. And then you've got two whole days in between there, and that's four days. We might not normally talk that way, but even the enemies of Jesus, they did not accuse Jesus of contradicting himself. In fact, after Jesus died and was buried, the enemies of Jesus came to... Uh, uh, after, excuse me, after he died, they came to Jesus and they said, um, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how that deceiver said, After three days I will rise, therefore command the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Why would the enemies of Jesus only want the tomb of Jesus secure until the third day if they remembered him saying that he would rise after three days? Why is that? Because in that day and that time, whether we like it or not, after three days and on the third day, it meant basically the same thing. And you and I probably should be careful not to get the big head and think that, well, you know, the way that we talk today is superior to the way that they talked back then. Let me ask you something. If you check into a hotel at 9.30 at night, and someone comes to your room and says, it's time to check out. It's 11 o'clock in the morning. It's time to check out. And you say, time to check out? I paid for a hotel, a day in this hotel. I know you did. And check out's at 11 o'clock. But I haven't even been here close to 24 hours. So I'm going to stay here for at least another six or seven, eight hours. And so let's say they come back to your room. And let's say that you try to leave at 6.30 that night. And they charge you two days for that hotel room. And you go berserk because you say, I haven't even been here 24 hours and you're charging me two days for that hotel room? How can that be right? Well, you and I know that you have to have time to clean the rooms and you want a clean room, right? So it somewhat makes sense to us, but maybe there are some people who come to this country who say, how could you charge me for two days in a hotel room? when I haven't even been in that room for 24 hours. So I would suggest to you that there might be some examples in our own day, in our own time, in our own culture, where other people around the world might look at us and scratch their head and say, well, those Americans, they do some things in some pretty funny ways. So let's be careful when we read and study the Bible and just assume, oh, that we are the elite, you know, English-speaking Americans who only do things the right ways and always do their things the right ways, and those ignorant you know, people back in uh, the old days, they just did not know what they were doing. No, they knew what they were doing, but it was the way that they spoke. Listen, when someone comes to our country, as we talked about a couple of nights ago, maybe it was last night, and they learn all these uh, you know, English idioms like there's a fork in a road, I have a frog in my throat, I quit cold turkey, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. they may look at us thinking, Boy, those crazy Americans, they have some weird ways of saying things. So we ought to be careful, and we ought to allow the Bible as much as it's humanly possible to explain the Bible. It has been such a pleasure, such a pleasure to be with you all 
this weekend. I can't think of a better way to end the weekend than to one more time offer, not my invitation, not your invitation, though I will say that you are our, you would be our invited guest at, uh, in Wetumpka, Alabama with the Wetumpka Church of Christ or at Apologetics Press in Montgomery, Alabama. Listen, I will take two pieces of bread and put some turkey or ham, or ham in between it and, and we'll sit down there and break bread together. See, that's another figure of speech. Uh, there at Apologetics Press sometime if you come and visit us. That's my invitation. But you know what's not my invitation? And that is to become a Christian. I want people to become Christians. I want everybody to be a Christian and live the Christian life. But you see, I don't have the, uh, the authority or the power to offer someone eternal life. That comes from God. That comes from Jesus Christ. And it's His invitation to anyone and everyone, 24-7. If there's someone here today who's not a Christian, Jesus is pleading with you. And He is using teachers and preachers and loved ones to plead with you on His behalf as He is the King of kings and Lord of lords who offers salvation. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And if you're not a Christian today, won't you become one answering the invitation of Jesus by confessing your faith in Him, turning away from sin and being buried in the watery grave of baptism? If you are a Christian but have fallen away and need to be restored to Jesus and to His church, allowing the church to pray for you and with you as you repent of sin and confess those sins there's nothing like being a part of a loving body of believers who are willing to encourage you and help you and love you every step of the way. If you need to respond to the invitation, why don't you do so as we stand and as we sing.